identity. Identity. That word identity is all over the place in our society. Think about it. Think about the word identity crisis. Identity theft. Identity protection. Identity verification. Cultural identity. Etc. 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 But what does that even mean? What does it mean to have an identity? And what does it mean to have a Christian identity? What does it mean to be a Christian person? What does, it, what does it mean that you have this Christian identity? How does it affect your life? These are some of the key questions that we're going to be trying to answer over the next four weeks during this ministry series, Identity Crisis. If you are not a member here, if you're visiting with us, you can follow along with us in this four-week ministry series. The link for uh, this, this uh, ministry series is on the front of your bulletin. Uh, the sermons are posted there each week. And in this congregation and college students, we, we estimate that there are around 120 people that will be gathered in homes over the next four weeks in small group Bible studies. Uh, so if you are not in a small group Bible study, all of the materials that you need to participate in this study are also available to you online. I encourage you to, to take this, use it as a family devotion, or even better, invite your neighbors over, some, some co-workers, study together. If you have questions, let me know. And if you decide to do this on your own, let me know how it goes. I'd love to hear and encourage and support you. Today, the question that we ask is this. Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? What identifying characteristics do you use to describe yourself? What makes you, you? I, on the most basic level, if I describe myself, I suppose I'd say I'm 6'1", or on a day where I'm feeling you know, powerful, 6'2", short blonde hair, glasses, I don't know. Sometimes I like my physical characteristics. Sometimes I don't. But we live in a society where individuals seem to be focused on self. Self-identity. Self-promotion. Self-help. Self-esteem. Self-defense. Self-image. Selfie. Selfie. Selfie, it's a word that got introduced into the Merriam-Webster Dictionary last year in 2014. Selfie, it means to take a, take a picture of oneself for the purpose of taking a picture of oneself. And I guess while we're at it, we might as well take a picture of ourselves, right? Everybody uh, up here, I gotta, gotta put it on the selfie camera. Everybody smile. Everybody, and almost everybody, I need a salty stick. What do you think? Oh, hang on a second. I got to post this on Facebook. Let's see if it works. Where do I, where, how do I do this? I need a college student. Here, hang on. Facebook. Uh, having fun at church. Where are we? Where are we? It's Peter Paul. Bear with me. This is important. The more likes I get, the better I will feel about myself. There you go. If we're not friends, you can find me. All right, cool. Selfie. Selfie. I saw some of you. Uh, I saw some of you putting on your best face, your best smile. I saw some of you turning and ducking and, and hiding from the camera. All of you are obsessed with self. All of you are, whether you were trying to get in that shop or you were trying to get out of it, you were obsessed with yourself. Because either you're trying hard to work on yourself and your self-image and putting all kinds of time into making yourself better, or you are focused on yourself because you're trying to run away from who it is that you are. Everyone is obsessed with themselves. We love focusing on ourselves. I just wonder how accurately it is 
that we describe ourselves. You got a piece of tin foil just a minute ago. Take it out. That was a good time to look at it. I didn't expect how noisy this would be. That's all right. If you can figure out where the shiny side of your foil is, take a look at the shiny side. And I want you to see if you can see yourself in there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, do your hair. Touch up your makeup. Can you see yourself? Get, get really close. Put it right up in your face. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I need to take a picture of this. <laughs> Can you see yourself? All right. Set it, set it back down a little bit. Set it, set it down for us to think about that. Maybe you can see yourself, depending on how the light was shining, how crumpled up your tin foil was. Maybe you couldn't see yourself at all, but pretend, pretend at least imagine that you could see a little bit of a reflection. Maybe just a little bit of a reflection, but what it is that you just saw in that piece of tin foil, obviously is not as clear as the reflection that you would see in your bathroom mirror at home. Unless your bathroom mirror is like, like ours at home with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, all the toothpaste splatters and soap splatters and little handprints trying to wipe it up, you don't quite get a clear image either. But the image that you see, looking at that piece of tin foil, we can say that your image is distorted. The way that you just saw yourself in that piece of tin foil, your image is distorted. And that's exactly what sin has done to all of our identities. The way that we see ourselves, the way that we see other people, even the way that we see this entire creation. But it only makes sense that the way we see this world would be distorted, the way we see ourselves would be distorted. We read in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 this morning, sorry, the very beginning of the creation story. And we see in the very beginning that the man Adam was completely dependent on his God. Adam did not choose to be created. He did not choose when he would be created. He did not choose what sort of physical characteristics he would have or where he would be created. He did not have a choice. He was a creature, and his God was the creator. You didn't get a choice either. Sorry to tell you, you didn't get to choose who your parents would be. You didn't get to choose where or when you would be born. You did not get to choose where you would, what you will look like. You didn't get to choose your identifying characteristics. So how did you become the people that you are? Some of it, we could call it genetic identity code passed on to you from your parents. But ultimately, you know what you are? A creature. Part of God's creation. A gift of God. You are a creature and your God brought you into this world. However, Adam and Eve from the very beginning struggled with this core concept of identity that they are creatures and that God is creator. See, this was their temptation in the garden, wasn't it? That they were tempted to be not content. Satan said to them, don't you want to be like God? Come on, you don't want to be creatures. You want to be like God and no good and evil. And they thought, yeah, yes, that sounds good. And ever since that time, ever since that fall into sin, this has been the root cause of all sin. <clears throat> all of your sin, all sin of humanity is rooted and grounded in the fact that you and I are not content being creatures. We all want to be God. Think about it in terms of our identity. Your identifying characteristics. See, there are all kinds of things that we can change about our identifying characteristics. There are all kinds of things we cannot change about our identifying characteristics. There are things we would love to change about ourselves, and there are things that we would never change about ourselves. When I talk about my own life, my own identifying characteristics, 
characteristics. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but at one point in time, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am currently. At one point in time, I did not wear glasses. At one point in time, I did have very crooked teeth. And at one time, I had my hair down below my ears, and I would braid it, do all kinds of crazy stuff. But thank God, I have modified and changed my physical identifying characteristics. There are things that we can change, things we cannot change, but have you ever considered where the line is? Where is the line in terms of modifying or changing your identity or the identity even of this creation? There's a lot of gray area to hear all of that. And because there's a lot of gray area, there are a lot of opinions. And because there are a lot of opinions, whenever you have a lot of opinions with sinful people, you know what you get? Debates. And there are all kinds of debates about what can be changed, what can be modified. Our world currently is sitting right on the edge of many moral and ethical debates about identity. Human identity and even the identity of this created world. Think about it. Due to ever-increasing technological advances, we can change and modify many things about ourselves, and we can change and modify many things of this created world around us. The question, though, especially for Christians, is should we? Should we? The real challenge, the real challenge here is when is changing our identifying characteristics, when is changing the identity of the world, when is it simply taking care of God's good creation in the way we were appointed to do? And when is it playing God? I'll encourage you to think about it like this. By very definition, God is God because he is creator. By very definition, God is God because he is creator. That's the definition of God. He creates. And when God creates, he creates with purpose and intent. So, when modifying, changing identity, identifying characteristics of ourselves, of the world, we should ask the question, am I changing or modifying God's intention for the way that this thing was created to be? And so, I'll just simply say to you, pray and pray often, because it's not always an easy question to answer. And you can pray like this. Lord, am I trying to be you? Let me not. Lord, am I trying to be like you? Let me not be like you. Let me be content with your good creation. I'll just say it bluntly, because if you do not first get this relationship correct, if you do not first understand that God is God, and you are not, you will struggle your whole life to find your identity. If you do not first understand that your God is a loving God who creates out of love with purpose and intent to form you as you are, and you are his dearly loved, redeemed child, as sinful and distorted as you are, if you don't first understand this relationship, you will struggle to find your identity your whole life. And as you wrestle through all of these moral, ethical debates that you are all aware about, you will struggle your whole life to find a foundation on which to base your decisions. Otherwise, your decisions will always just be based on what you feel is appropriate, based on your own emotions and feelings. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves. Sometimes we think just way too highly of ourselves when we think that we can somehow, somehow outwork the sin that is before us, distorting our image. As if, as if I told you all again, you don't have to, but if I, if I handed you that piece of tinfoil, and I said, look in this, and, 
and see yourself. And you would say, I can't. And I, and, I, and I then said, here, take this bottle of Windex and a paper towel and spray it and wipe it and spray it and wipe it. And eventually, if you spray and wipe hard enough, you'll be able to see a crystal clear image of yourself. As if you could do that and then take it out and then use that to do your makeup or your hair. For you guys, it, maybe it would actually help you to do your makeup, right? <laughs> Some of you are just going in the dark. I don't, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> As if you could somehow outwork the sin that is before you. You can't. You can't. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves and think we can outwork it. Others of us are at other times get so frustrated and burdened with the distorted image that's in front of us. And what I mean by this is like it's like you would get frustrated with a piece of tinfoil. The thing that you see your reflection in. Your sin. Some of you get so burdened by the fact that you don't like who you are because of sin and its effects on you, whether it be emotional or physical. Some of you are facing difficult, stressful times in your life due to the brokenness in this world, whether it be with relationships or illnesses, and you look at that and you just say, I can't see anything clearly that this whole world is so messed up. See, every one of us struggles to see ourselves in the way that God sees us. See, when God looks at you, when God looks at you, he sees you clearly. When God looks at you, he sees you perfectly. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you through a piece of tinfoil. He doesn't see you in a reflection of toothpaste and soap-covered mirrors. He doesn't see you through a bug-splattered windshield. When God looks at you, he sees you through the lens of Jesus Christ. You know that? When God looks at you, when your Creator looks at you, He sees you without stain, without mark, without blemish. He sees you right, righteous. When God looks at you, He sees you so clearly, so perfectly, because He sees you through the lens and the light of Jesus Christ our Lord. You are a dearly loved child of God, created in the image of God, created for the purpose of God, created with the intent of God. And you know what that is? You know what that is? To proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, there was a time when you were not a child, but now you are a child. There was a time when you dwelt in sin and darkness, but because of Jesus Christ, you are alive. And because of Jesus, God sees you rightly. God sees you rightly. And you are more than a child. You're more than just a child. You are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a people belonging to God. God has called you, claimed you, enlightened you, created you with a purpose. He loves you just as you are. You're a child of God. And your purpose, again, the purpose with which God has created you, is to proclaim His excellencies. Proclaim excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Your job in this creation is to speak highly of your God, not of yourself. Let me say that again. Your job in this creation is to speak highly of your God, not of yourself. I want you to hang on to that piece of tinfoil over the next few weeks. Maybe put it someplace prominent in your house. Maybe even tape it on your bathroom mirror. Be reminded when you look at that piece of tinfoil, the damage that sin does to the way that you see yourself. Because you are so tempted to see yourself with your own flaws, with your own frailties, with the things that you would love to change about yourself. And then look in that mirror, look in the clear mirror, and get a better image of seeing, ah, I am a child of God. And then remember, even on top of that, 
that God sees you even more clearly. More clearly, perfectly, He sees you. As we study together the next four weeks, who we are, whose we are, remember first that God is God, and we are not. And that is a good place for us to be. Through Jesus Christ, your Lord, and His death and His resurrection, you are perfect. Perfect, righteous before your Creator. May you live in His love, live in His image, and proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Who am I? Who are you? Children of God, alive in Christ. In His name, amen.